Okay, hello everyone. This is Colin Cox, and this is the week two lecture for English 1020. Today, what I want to do, I asked you to read several poems. If I have an opportunity, I will certainly try to talk about all of those poems, but I want to start, and you'll notice this lecture will feel like a continuation of a lot of the work I did last week in last week's lecture. Again, just trying to illustrate for you what literary analysis looks like, the sorts of questions you can ask, and using those questions or, or coming to a better understanding of how asking those kinds of questions puts you in a position where you are not just summarizing a text, but where you're actually doing the work of analyzing the text. And again, I would just remind you of that distinction or that dichotomy. There is certainly a difference between summary and analysis. Summary, as I explained last week, attempts to answer perhaps a question or a simple question, what happened? Whereas analysis, it's far more robust. It's attempting to do many different things. Summary, it's certainly a component of analysis, but analysis tries to dig deeper. It tries to ask questions like why or how or to what effect. So today, again, I want to try to illustrate what literary analysis looks like, and I want to start with the Gwendolyn Brooks poem, We Real Cool. And you'll notice in the announcements feed, I posted a link to actually a video on YouTube of Brooks reading this poem. And one of the things that I want you to think about, and listen, I'll talk about this repeatedly throughout the semester, that when we go to the author, whether it's the author of a poem, a novel, a filmmaker, we should be extremely skeptical of just accepting the author's reasons or the author's explanations for why a text exists or to, to what effect it exists or what we as readers should ultimately take from it. Because when you do that, and doing so, it's called perhaps making an appeal to authorial intent. When you do that, while it might be clarifying in some ways, it has the effect of potentially limiting your analytical abilities, or, or it has this potential to actually close some potential avenues of analysis and exploration. And again, I'll talk about this repeatedly throughout the semester, but one of the things I want you to embrace, or one of the things I at least want you to entertain, is the idea that while an author of a text might have some sense of why they wrote what they wrote, filmed what they filmed, etc., there might be ideas and concepts and notions that are quite simply beyond their full ability to understand. And I would encourage you just think about all the times in your life when you've done something or made a decision and then you almost immediately said or thought, I don't even know why I did that. Why did I do that? And I think what that shows or what that implies is that you are not always in complete control of the choices you make and the decisions you make. And while I know we like to do this thing where we assume, well, hey, I may have no idea why I do what I do, but hey, if you're an author or a poet or a playwright or a novelist and your work appears in these big grand anthologies that people use in literature courses, well, surely you have a sense of why you do what you do or why you did what you did, but I would encourage you perhaps to reject that idea that great authors like Gwendolyn Brooks Maybe there are some gaps. Maybe there are some things that she didn't fully understand, just like there might be things that any of the poets that we read today or any of the poets or the writers that we will read in the future, again, there might be gaps, things they don't fully understand. Therefore, while it can be useful to appeal to the author, think of that as just one perspective among many. And again, don't foreclose or, or don't, 
exclude any potential avenues of interpretation because you know what the author thinks because when you watch that video there's a one to two minute preface before she actually reads the poem where she explains exactly what she was thinking so again the thing to remember don't foreclose possibilities simply because the author has said hey this is what i was thinking or this is the inspiration just remain open and allow yourself to entertain any possible avenues of interpretation okay with that said let's read we real cool together and remember this poem begins on page 779 the pool players seven at the golden shovel we real cool, we left school, we lurk late, we strike straight, we sing sin, we thin gin, we jazz June, we die soon. So structurally, one of the things you might notice, just thinking about the way the poem feels, the way it reads, the way it looks on the page, this word we is extremely important. And the thing that's interesting, and here's what I would encourage you to think about, and again, this is a question that gets at the structure of the poem. Why does Brooks structure the poem the way she does? Why have the word we, which in theory, take for example, line three, we real cool we, that's the entire line. Why allow what should be, or why put what should be the first word of the next line at the end of line three? And she does this repeatedly throughout the poem. Why does she do that? What is the effect of doing that? Because I think one way you could read this, it has this effect of, even though this is a poem with distinct lines, it has this effect of allowing the poem to just feel like it's one big, long line. It doesn't actually feel, because of how it reads, it's really hard to notice or detect any pauses or gaps. And again, the question worth asking is, why would she do that? What's the effect? Because a word like we almost functions as a punctuation mark, especially when you read it the way Brooks does, which I think that's actually quite interesting and instructive because when you go and watch that video or listen to that audio, what you'll notice is she says, we real cool, we, and then she transitions to the next line. So a word like we almost functions as a punctuation mark. And what I think is interesting about it is how this is not a poem necessarily about a single individual with a single unified voice. And now we're thinking about the speaker of the poem. Who is the speaker? It's not Brooks. She's the author. She's the poet. But it's someone else who's actually speaking here. And by emphasizing this word we, by repeating this word we, by almost using it as perhaps a kind of punctuation mark at the end of so many lines, it brings to our attention how, again, they are not isolated or separate individuals. They almost see themselves as part of a collective. But a collective that intends to do what? That aspires to do what? Well, perhaps to answer that question, we should look at the content of the poem itself. Notice one of the first things they say is they are cool. And this is an interesting word because obviously Brooks uses it in the title of the poem, but I think what Brooks almost wants us to think here is, well, how are we, how does she, that is to say, dramatize and conceptualize this notion of coolness. What does it mean ultimately to be cool according to these speakers? Well, I think one of the things we could deduce is to be cool is to be rebellious, perhaps. Notice what follows immediately after line three, we real cool, we left school. So this idea that they are these transient figures who, if they were at school at all, they were potentially only there for a moment or two. And after leaving school, they go to the pool hall, they drink, they are out late, they uh, 
sing and perhaps do so in a way that's so boisterous that it's a bit disruptive. Again, notice that this idea of coolness, one of the things we could say perhaps at the beginning or one of the first observations we could make, if we want to think of a word like cool as a kind of symbol or a signifier, we always have, all of us have a distinct impression of what it means to be cool. But within the context of this poem, Brooks or, or these speakers, to be more accurate, they are equating coolness with rebelliousness, perhaps rebelling against a kind of established order. But what's also interesting about it is how the poem ends, how this perhaps move toward being cool and by doing so embracing a kind of rebellious lifestyle could potentially lead to an early and untimely death because the final two lines, we jazz June, we die soon. And it's unmistakable because Gwendolyn Brooks was a black poet. It's unmistakable to uh, not consider, or, or it would be a mistake, it's almost impossible not to consider notions and questions of race when thinking about this poem, because in addition to the life they live or the life they aspire to live, I think part of what is so potentially tragic about this poem is just this simple question or this, this idea that Brooks wants to explore is there any alternative for young black men in the United States? Is, is this too often what their lives look like? Do they have any alternative? Do they have any way out? And if they don't, who, who is potentially to blame? For that? Is it, is it theirs and theirs alone? Are they solely responsible for their behavior and their choices? Is it cultural? Is it societal? Is it a combination of those two or three? Again, how, how are we to think about what motivates their decisions and what sorts of conclusions might we draw when asking that kind of question? To what degree are these young men responsible or culpable for this notion that they will die soon? Again, is it on them and them alone? Because again, one of the more interesting mythological ideas that permeates American consciousness is this notion of the American dream, the idea that if you as an individual work hard, have the right values, you will succeed. And I describe it as a kind of mythology because I think we all know that regrettably that's not true. Far too often there are powers and there are forms of influence beyond any one individual's power or control. And when thought about that way, when framed that way, I wonder if we're perhaps led to conclude that, and this is perhaps not so much the irony of the poem, but again, something that almost deepens this sense of tragedy. These speakers understand that. They understand that as individuals, they have very little power, very little control. And instead of fighting against, perhaps, instead of raging against those forms of influence beyond them, they retreat into a kind of nihilism, one that perhaps accepts or has reconciled itself to this idea that they will just inevitably die quite soon, rather prematurely, and maybe the only, I don't even know if I would call it a sense of hope, but something that Brooks seems interested in showing us is even though they understand this about themselves and even though they understand this about their lives, they are together. They're not separate, they're not alone, they're not isolated. Now, perhaps as a collective group, they are isolated, but 
they have one another. They have formed this bond or this community around this sense of exclusion. Again, you could argue, but they're doing it to and for themselves. But I would ask you to just return to uh, one of the questions I asked a moment ago. To what degree are they ultimately responsible for this behavior? To what degree should we also implicate society, culture, law, etc.? So the final thing I want to say, though, is just, again, how the poem sounds, the words, the diction that Brooks uses, because there is a lot of interesting rhyming and alliteration and repetition. We talked about the we. You'll notice there are, again, interesting bits of alliteration. So lurk late, strike straight, sing sin, thin gin. All of this has, or I would encourage you to pause and just think about how does this feel? Because it's always felt hypnotic to me. And again, why would Brooks do that? What's the point? What's the effect? Those are interesting questions worth thinking about and exploring. So from here, let's transition to the Langston Hughes poem, Ballad of the Landlord. And this poem begins on page 778. And if you will, follow along with me. Landlord, landlord, my roof has sprung a leak. Don't you remember I told you about it way last week? Landlord, landlord, these steps is broken down. When you come up yourself, it's a wonder you don't fall down. Ten bucks you say I owe you. Ten bucks you say is due. Well, that's ten bucks more and I'll pay you till you fix this house up new. What? You gonna get eviction orders? You gonna cut off my heat? You gonna take my furniture and throw it in the street? Uh-huh, you talking high and mighty, talk on till you get through. You ain't gonna be able to say a word if I land my fist on you. Police, police, come and get this man. He's trying to ruin the government and overturn the land. Coppers whistle. Patrol, bell, arrest, precinct, station, iron cell, headlines, in press. Man threatens landlord, tenant held no bell, judge gives Negro 90 days in county jail. So like the Gwendolyn Brooks poem, We Real Cool, if we wanted to do a bit of analysis about the language and the diction of this poem, I think you might find they feel and read quite similar. This is a poem like We Real Cool that doesn't use elevated diction or language. It feels conversational. It feels perhaps in that way you might argue real as opposed to if you could just envision whatever characterization you have of a canonical poet like William Shakespeare. This doesn't feel that way. And why would Hughes do that? So like Gwendolyn Brooks, Langston Hughes was a black poet, often in his poetry. And we'll see this later in the semester. He dramatizes the plight of black Americans in the United States during Jim Crow. And again, I think here you can almost sense or you could almost deduce that what Hughes wants to bring to poetry is something that feels real, something that doesn't feel like some of those canonical white English authors. He, he wants poetry of his people to feel and reflect not just what they experienced, but how they sounded, how they expressed themselves. And we can see in the experience, perhaps in the story he tells, in the themes he develops, this notion of housing and housing inequality. When we get to the play a Raisin in the Sun by Lorraine Hainsbury, I would encourage you to think back to this poem because that's precisely what that play is about. It's about redlining in Chicago and it's about housing inequality. And I think in that way, and this is again, uh, 
way of analyzing this text that asks the similar, or let me try again, it asks the same sorts of questions that I encouraged you to ask with We Real Cool. To what degree, if at all, should we implicate the speaker and the speaker alone? How does this poem help us better understand perhaps these larger societal systemic issues and problems? Because I think what's interesting about the first couple of stanzas is how the speaker of this poem pay attention to what he, she, they want. They want their home to uh, work. They want their home to be an actual home. They want it to function as a shelter. Notice line two, my roof has sprung a leak. And then in the second stanza, these steps is broken down. When you come up yourself, it's a wonder you don't fall down. So there's this sense that this, this house, which would have certainly been an apartment that obviously this person rents, it's, it's a misnomer to call it a house, but this living quarter, this apartment, it's, it's deteriorated to the point that it's, it's practically unlivable. But notice in stanza three what we learn, and what's really interesting about this is so much of what this landlord says it's filtered through the voice of the speaker. Ten bucks, you say, I owe you. Ten bucks, you say, is due. Well, that's ten bucks more, and I'll pay you till you fix this house up new. So there's this idea that, according to the speaker, the landlord actually demands payment, perhaps, for rent, but this landlord continues to ask perhaps for rent or or if we wanted to be perhaps more accurate additional funds to just do what in theory is is part of paying rent that you know you as the landlord will make whenever necessary this place livable that's not something that a tenant should pay in addition to their their monthly rent and when asking for something that simple when when asking for simple amenities like a roof that doesn't leak or stairs that don't have holes and gaps in them notice how quickly everything escalates once the tenant asks for these repairs to be done the landlord moves immediately to eviction, which, again, what I would encourage you to pay attention to is the sequencing of this information, because I think here is another example of how form reveals an important theme or idea that Hughes wants to dramatize, that within just two or three stanzas, we have moved from, hey, can you fix my roof to, wait, you're evicting me, which, again, Pause for a moment. Why do you think Hughes would do that? Is it is it possible that an eviction when a black tenant asks for repairs? Is it is it true that those sorts of eviction notices happen that quickly? Or is it possible that what Hughes wants to dramatize here is how it feels? That at any moment when a black tenant asks for a hole in a roof to be repaired or stairs leading to the house or the apartment to be repaired, what they can expect, what would almost immediately follow is skepticism and then an eviction notice. So I think in form, what Hughes does that is quite interesting is he actually speaks to or, or he attempts to dramatize just how it feels. Because again, I don't think his point is it literally happens this fast, but the threat of it happening, it could come at you or, or it could arrive this quickly. And then notice, once again, how everything just escalates. And, and also notice when the police come, who do they believe? Who do they trust? Well, it's not the tenant with a hole in their roof and stairs that don't work, but it's the it's the landlord. He, she, they, it would have been he, but 
they're the ones the police believe. And then notice the severity of the punishment. And we see this in the final three lines. Man threatens landlord, tenant held no bell, judge gives Negro 90 days in county jail. And you might respond to this and say, well, but the, the tenant did quite literally threaten him. But I suppose one of the points that Hughes wants to make is, well, what led to that threat or, or what forms of escalation, what sorts of inequality and what sorts of unfair treatment led this tenant to the point that he would threaten, threaten, not act. And I think this is important as well. This, this person goes to jail just for a threat. It's just a simple threat that puts him in prison for 90 days, right? Held without bail for 90 and, and subsequently receiving a 90 day prison sentence, not for attacking someone, but for threatening to attack someone. So again, I think perhaps what Hughes wants to suggest or, or perhaps reveal in a moment like this is how even the suspicion of threat or, or even the suspicion of something has consequences for some and not for others. Because I wonder, what would you call being a landlord and deliberately not repairing a roof that needs it, repairing stairs that need it? What is that exactly? How would you describe or characterize that behavior? Is that threatening? Is that meant to send a particular sort of message? And if so, what is that message? But if we wanted to go back and say something about form, I think that's also what's really interesting about this poem, is how at times it feels like a dramatic monologue, but then there are other moments when Hughes does some interesting stylistic things, or he makes some interesting stylistic choices. Notice, for example, the language in italics that begins around line 21. Police, police, come and get this man. He's trying to ruin the government and overturn the land. I think this is a moment where, as readers, we need to be as, as discerning as possible, because I don't think this is the same speaker who started the poem. And I think there's a couple of ways that Hughes signals that to us. I think the first, obviously, by placing that language in italics, it's meant to show or distinguish this language from what came before. But I think also just listen to how it sounds. It sounds different. It's almost as if we're getting a different character here, as if perhaps for the first time, Hughes shows us the landlord himself, or perhaps someone else speaking, but also notice the implication of the call to the police. Police, police, come and get this man. He's trying to ruin the government and overturn the land. This is extremely interesting because this has the effect of escalating the threat or, or adding perhaps an additional component or some additional components to this threat that the tenant levels at this landlord, that it's not just that this tenant threatened him physically, but in particular, those two lines, he's trying to ruin the government and overturn the land. I think it speaks to this larger sense of threat, this misplaced sense of threat that figures like the landlord obviously feel. And again, we need to do a bit of decoding here to potentially understand the racial dynamics between the tenant and the landlord, because we learn unambiguously that the tenant is black, but if we were to make an assumption, I think the assumption we should make is the landlord is not. The landlord is perhaps white. And again, paying attention to how Hughes, in a rather subtle way, speaks to some of the fears associated with these racial dynamics and how the threat that this tenant poses, it's, it's not just a, hey, 
I'll punch you for asking for something absurd, but it's much bigger than that for him. And an extension of this sense of threat, I would argue, is quite visible in the punishment that this black tenant receives. Again, for just threatening this landlord, he is held without bail and receives 90 days in jail. So again, here, notice what Hughes does. It's not just a situation where he implicates the landlord, but he's also implicating law enforcement. He's implicating the legal and the justice system. All of these ideas are at play in this poem in interesting and thought-provoking ways. So I think to end, because the last lecture was a bit longer than I would want a week one lecture to be, I think I'll finish today with the Dorothy Parker poem, To a Certain Lady, and this poem, it's on 776. So if you would, go to 776. Okay, follow along with me. Oh, I can smile for you and tilt my head and drink your rushing words with eager lips and paint my mouth for you a fragrant red and trace your brows with tutored fingertips when you rehearse your list of loves to me. Oh, I can laugh and marvel, rapturous-eyed, and you laugh back, nor can you ever see the thousand deaths my heart has died. And you believe so well I know my part, that I am gay as morning, light as snow, and all the straining things within my heart you'll never know. Oh, I can laugh and listen when we meet, and you bring tales of fresh adventurings, of ladies delicately indiscreet, of lingering hands and gently whispered things, and you are pleased with me and strive anew to sing me sagas of your late delights. Thus do you want me, marveling, gay, and true, nor do you see my staring eyes of night. And when, in search of novelty, you stray, oh, I can kiss you blithely as you go, and what goes on, my love, while you're away, you'll never know. So the first thing I would just offer a bit of clarification about one of the words Parker uses. You'll notice she uses the word gay, and because of when she wrote this poem in 1937, I think it's important to just acknowledge that a word like gay here means happy, because again, language is fluid, words and meaning often change. It does not, at least I would argue, imply homosexuality. It implies happiness. But let's start with the speaker. So I think one of the interesting things about this poem is how this speaker, she's addressing someone else, but she's also addressing us. So, or let me modify that a little. When I say she's addressing someone else, I don't think we should imagine that she speaks this poem in this person's presence, in particular when you think about what she reveals at the end of the poem. I think more than anything it's directed at this person, or it's written almost with this person as a kind of inspiration. And this is something in particular in dramatic monologues that happens quite often. Directing the, the speaker in a poem or a text directs their speech act at an actual person, maybe it's a long dead historical figure. This is something, for example, that William Wordsworth in the poem London 1802 does, and the actual technique it's called apostrophe, and it's spelled just like the grammatical mark, but again, it's this way of addressing a speech act at a particular person, an inanimate object, an idea, etc. But I think we could say something about why Parker's speaker does this, because you could ask yourself an interesting set of questions, like why direct it at this person? What does that imply? Well, when we reach the end of the poem and we realize that how she presents herself to this person 
it's not entirely who she is or there's a degree of subterfuge at play. You could almost imagine there's a kind of wish fulfillment by directing the poem or directing the speech act to him or at him as if, my God, I would love for you to know this. But part of it, and I think this is important, remaining or or allowing her behavior to uh, remain hidden there's a obvious sort of pleasure attached to it but and and i think this is something any of us know especially if we have a secret but we we almost have this perverse impulse to reveal the secret there's almost something quite quite fun and quite mischievous about knowing a secret and then wanting to say it but also knowing that it would perhaps be beneficial to keep it anyway i think all of those ideas are tethered or or all of those ideas are connected to not only who she wants to direct the poem to but the simple fact that the poem it's obviously directed at someone and i think what parker does that's quite interesting in this poem is speak to the forms of perhaps deception or the forms of subterfuge or the way that perhaps at times certain behavior and and certain forms of speech need to be coded by certain people because there is this sense that whomever it is she speaks to he is quite free and quite open for example about his sexual escapades and and his quote conquests but perhaps what what the poem wants us to think is well he thinks that this is something that he's able to do exclusively that this is something that she the speaker of the poem does not have the ability or the capacity to do. And obviously, this is something that the end of the poem certainly disabuses us of, or this is an idea that the end of the poem disabuses us of. Notice here at the end of the poem, nor do you see my staring eyes at night, and when in search of novelty you stray, oh, I can kiss you blithely as you go, and what goes on, my love, while you're away, you'll never know. So, Again, I think what's interesting about this dramatic reveal at the end of the poem is the speaker as we've known her and the speaker as we've understood her to this point, it's a kind of deception that she's performed on us, the audience, as well. And again, perhaps the question worth asking, this is something I mentioned at the beginning of today's lecture, analysis attempts to ask why well why would she do this and i think part of it is you have this sense that parker wants to engage certain stereotypes about dynamics that often exist in relationships between well let's be more specific heterosexual relationships between men and women. The poem begins, and I think it gives us this sense that Parker, her speaker, deliberately self-fashions as the sort of woman or the sort of figure who just listens and perhaps doesn't really speak that much and she does so with a smile on her face and she tilts her head and she quote drinks your rushing words with eager lips and even this idea that she paints her mouth with a fragrant red thinking about red as a seductive color it's meant to imply passion sex but it can also imply rage and anger so even doing a bit of analysis of why red is present in this poem again i think all of this engages certain potential stereotypes and once again when we take the entirety of the poem and put it into a kind of context with the end of the poem. I think we have this sense that a lot of what's happening here is a deliberate self-fashioning on the speaker's part that has the intention of leading whomever this romantic counterpart is into thinking that he has nothing to worry about. And again, I, I think 
Parker deliberately doesn't specify the particular terms of their relationship. For example, there's no imagery that would imply they're married, perhaps in that way they're in a kind of relationship of a potential sexual nature, but neither party or, or in particular he hasn't made a commitment. And I think we know that Perhaps he hasn't made a commitment or he might be potentially incapable of making a commitment because of, again, those final few lines. And when in search of novelty you stray, which is to say when you need something new and you go out to find someone new. So again, there is this sense that there are shared feelings, that they they certainly share something, but they haven't made the big commitment yet. And I would I would encourage you or, or ask you to make whatever inferences you want about why they haven't made that kind of commitment. But I think what Parker's ultimately attempting to do in this poem is to show or demonstrate how she as a as a speaker or whomever this speaker is, how she doesn't take these transgressions of his passively. She's not, even though she she frames herself as a kind of passive figure throughout the poem, all of that is a sort of misdirection, which, which lulls her companion into a sense of certainty. And again, because of this kind of coded language she uses both with us and and with him, we're we're almost perhaps just as surprised at the end as he would be if he were to learn this. But again, I think part of Parker's point is just the way some people are because of certain dynamics, whether they're sex and gender dynamics or racial dynamics, how some individuals have the ability to say what they want when they want and how some individuals don't have the ability to say what they want when they want. They are perhaps put in a position where they must use coded language. They must find ways to not only communicate, but they must find ways to get what they want in more indirect or, or by using more indirect means. But the final thing I would say is, again, it, it really hinges on words like, or phrases like, fresh adventuring and you bring tales of fresh adventuring of ladies delicately indiscreet of lingering hands and gently whispered things so what this does it 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 has this effect of initially at least rendering the speaker I've mentioned quite passive, but if we wanted to use conquest terminology, the speaker and perhaps women at large, according to the speaker, are conquests. They are, they are things to be possessed by men. And in that way, men are extremely active. So there is this dichotomy between passivity and activity. But notice how, again, Parker at the end of the poem fundamentally inverts that idea. And, and again, I think for someone like Parker, there is something quite radical about suggesting that women can be just as active. Women can perhaps enjoy these kinds of sexual conquests in the ways that men do. And, and by framing it, again, the way she does, by suggesting that there are these forms or these ways of coding language and coding behavior, I think the question she ultimately wants us to consider is, well, who's passive and who's active actually in this relationship? Because 
if you if you stopped reading around line 20, you would probably come to the conclusion that the speaker is passive and whomever her male counterpart is, he's the active one. But I think, again, because of the way that her language and obviously her behavior is coded and, again, the way she indulges in and uses forms of subterfuge, I think it almost has the effect of rendering her far more active than he is. And all of it hinges on what each party knows and what each party doesn't know. Because the way the poem dramatizes this is to suggest that he thinks she doesn't know but not only does she know what he does, but she knows what she does. And most importantly, he doesn't know that. So again, if you imagine, just think about these sorts of axiomatic phrases like knowledge is power. Well, by the end of the poem, who really has more knowledge? Who in that way is empowered? And I think it is unambiguously Parker's speaker. Okay, I think that's where I want to stop for this week. I Again, the first two weeks of this course, I have, through these audio lectures, tried to demonstrate not only what analysis looks like, but how you can pose certain questions and then follow those questions to arrive at interesting and thought-provoking observations that move you beyond summary. This is something I will continue to do throughout the semester, but if you're curious about how you can take some of these ideas and notions and apply it perhaps in an essay, whether it's a longer seven, eight hundred word essay, or even something short like a two or three hundred word essay. Next week, I will begin releasing videos where I discuss best practices. I'll again show you these student essays so you'll actually see that language on the page. I think all of this will help you better understand how you can take some of the practices that we've developed in these audio lectures and apply it to an actual written or typed, if I wanted to be more accurate, composition. Okay, so look for that next week. And don't forget, if I haven't said so, I've probably said so already, there are fantastic student essays in your textbook, in the Norton Anthology. So I would encourage you to become familiar with your textbook, look at those as well, but I'll have all of that material starting next week. So if you have any questions, don't hesitate to contact me. And until we speak again, this is Colin Cox for English 1020.